How will COVID-19 redefine what the European Union is all about? Hello, everyone, for France 24. I'm Francois Picard in Paris. And I'm Melinda Crane for Deutsche Welle in Berlin. In the European Union, healthcare has always been handled at the national level. So as the corona pandemic swept the continent, it was nation states that were calling the shots. Even between close EU neighbors, borders were closed, crucial medical exports were stopped, and solidarity was looking pretty illusory. But that is now changing, with French patients, for example, being treated in German hospitals. Yeah, and Melinda, uh, with a crisis that we're two months into, which uh, some are calling the biggest test for this continent since World War II, a lot of questions going forward. The French President Emmanuel Macron calling it a moment of truth ahead of Thursday's virtual summit. Uh, there are those that are eyeing de deconfinement and then other nations that are dumbling down. Uh, what common response can France and Germany, often dubbed the motor of uh, European unity, uh, rally a continent that's sure to face some major, major challenges, both within the European Union and from the rest of the world? Our title today, Is Corona Europe's Moment of Truth? France 24 and Deutsche Welle TV join up for the debate. Welcome. And joining us from Frankfurt, he's the former deputy mayor there, former student leader of May 68, and former co-leader of the Green Party in the European Parliament. Thank you so much, Daniel cohn for being with us. Hi. And joining us from his Berlin office is Matan von Marschall. He's a member of the German Bundestag, representing Freiburg, which lies close to the French border. And he's also a member of the Franco-German Parliamentary Assembly. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> From Strasbourg on the banks of the Rhine, uh, we are pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Siamak Aga Babae. Uh, doctor, you're an emergency physician and also member of the Municipal Council in Strasbourg. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Uh, over the past weeks, you've been doing a lot less politics uh, and uh, a, a lot more of your quote unquote day job. I know you've been uh, working out of the emergency dispatch it should be pointed out to our viewers, uh, Alsace, the region that borders Germany, uh, is one of the big clusters here in France. Originally, it was down in the southern part of Alsace in the city of Mulhouse, uh, but you also have been feeling the brunt of it. We know that the curve is flattened. What's the situation like this Tuesday? Well, this situation is a, a stabilization in the number of uh, people tested positive to the COVID-19. Uh, and the stabilization of number of people being hospitalized and uh, maybe uh, a little hope in people transferred in ICU, which is uh, on 10% uh, 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 less than the other days. So we, we still have people going to, uh, to the hospital. We still have people testing positive. We still have severe cases by the number of people dying and the number of people going to the ICO is declining. Siamakaga Babai, when you uh, first saw the cases coming out of China, coming out of Italy, did you think Alsace would be hit so hard? No, never. Uh, we, uh, we had the same image at first, the, the image that we had from SARS or from MERS uh, in the early uh, 2000. And we, uh, we thought that we can have something about uh, maybe 10 cases in Strasbourg. And then uh, in something like a week, uh, we saw people coming. We saw uh, first uh, elderly people uh, and then younger people with very severe cases. And we saw people dying and we saw people being transferred uh, to ICU units, the need of ICU beds. And then we were really surprised, but no one of our colleagues uh, were thinking that uh, the pandemics were coming at this rate in our region. Let me pick up with a question to Matan von Marshall, whose electoral district is just right across the Rhine River from that Alsace region that, as we have just heard, was hit very early and very hard by COVID. So, uh, Mr. von Marshall, what has that meant for the people in your district and for your region as a whole? That was and still is very difficult for our region. 
Um, you should probably know that about 40,000 people from Alsace move to my home region, to Südbaden, uh, to work, basically. But they all work in very important places, like, for example, hospitals. So we absolutely need these people. And um, as a sudden, they, they couldn't come, but also because we decided to close the border, as Alsace was uh, defined as a high-risk area. Why was it defined high-risk area? Um, because the infection spread ex exactly in that specific region, south of Colmar and direction to Mulhouse, because there was a church event with several thousand people. Uh, and um, these people, they were very close together. and. So the virus spread very fast in that area. Now, just these days, we can come back to slightly open the borders again, which is very important for our common life. And I hope and we will bring this topic into a meeting of the Committee of Cross-Border Cooperation, where I am member from the Deutsche Bundestag in this cross-border cooperation. This will uh, be a video conference this Thursday, and I very much hope that we can convince both sides, Germany and France, to make our cross-border cooperation more easy in the near future. Daniel Kuhn-Bendit, uh, Franco-German cooperation, well, that's literally in your DNA because you're a citizen of both countries. How do you think your two nations have risen to the challenge? Difficult. It's difficult because uh, for the French, it's difficult to see that it seems that uh, it's easier to be in Germany and that the, the handle the COVID or the COVID is not so explosive or less explosive than in France. And because uh, uh, in co this pandemic uh, f a pushed rea national reaction. So if so safety, sanity, safety, it, it's a national thing, and so the cooperation is 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 not good. It's not good. It's difficult, and I think that the French and the German government is not doing it well. It's not still, doing it still well. today. Still today. Yeah, you know, they did some wonderful things. There was, uh, you know, transfer from uh, France to Germany, etc. Yes, but even now, you know, even if you see the discussion that we have now for the post-pandemic, uh, the economic recovery, I think that France and, uh, France and Germany are not on the same track. And if France and Germany is not on the same track, then it will be very difficult in Europe. We want to, we want to come back to that question just a little bit later, but let me go now to Dr. Siamek uh, Babai, because we just heard from Daniel Cohn-Bendit that, in fact, there are many people in France who have a sense that somehow the Germans are doing it better. We've seen some surprising headlines coming out of France. Les Allemands, uh, pourquoi sont-ils meilleurs? Why are they better? Across the world, not only in Europe, but all over the world, it seems that the coronavirus is exposing the gaps and deficits in countries' health systems and in their economies. So what would you say you have seen about what needs to change in France? Well, what, what I can say about the differences, first of all, maybe it will be, um, it is uh, a difference on counting the dead people, because in France, all the dead people in this period uh, also uh, indirect uh, that people are counted as COVID death. But in Germany, if you have a diabetes or you have hypertension, you may be counted differently. When I said that, I can explain uh, all the differences. Well, the other part of the difference is maybe about uh, the number of beds per capita than you have in Germany. I think it's something about eight uh, beds for 1,000 inhabitants. In France, it's 5.9 uh, and the number of ICU beds uh, that you have in Germany, it's uh, two or three times higher than in France. So that can explain because when you have uh, se severe cases, it's your ability uh, to have ventilator, uh, mechanical uh, ventilation support uh, to save people. And if you have more ICU beds and you have 
more, uh, more ICU doctors and nurses, well-trained, then you can save people. So maybe one of the first lessons uh, it's that we need uh, efficient uh, public health services in all the countries in, in the European Union, in, around the world. And we need it uh, urgently to face other pandemics coming. Well, Siamak Agababei, uh, the uh, French spend more per capita on healthcare than the Germans. Why have they less to offer, as you've just described it? Well, because uh, we had um, a very uh, uh, accountant vision uh, on health policy in the uh, last 20 years. Uh, the, the last French government uh, was, uh, uh, was really, uh, had, a, had a really uh, austerity uh, policy on health and they closed something about uh, 20,000 beds uh, in uh, five years. So at, uh, at, some, at some moment, you're going to pay for this because you need these beds for the people. And uh, we in the emergency departments, we were saying that uh, for something about two or three, day, three years that we need beds, we need nurses, we need doctors, and we need budget spending on public health structures. Let me uh, say to Daniel Combenet, I know you wanted to weigh in here. We want to just bring in a brief report, and then I'd like to uh, come to you right after that. So even between close neighbors in the European Union, not only the effects of the virus, but also the responses to it have diverged pretty widely. The lockdown restrictions here in Germany, for example, were never as drastic as those in France, and in fact are now slowly being relaxed. My Deutsche Welle colleague, Michael Küffner, has this short report from Berlin. Four weeks into nationwide contact restrictions, the government is beginning to loosen its tight grip on public life. And German Chancellor Angela Merkel is cautioning Germans to be responsible with their regained freedoms. We're now lifting some of these restrictions, but we don't know exactly what the consequences will be. And that's why we have to take this slowly, step by step. It would be a great shame if we now knowingly headed into a relapse. At varying speeds, German federal states are allowing medium-sized shops to open, but hotels and restaurants have to remain closed. People on the streets of Berlin are torn between a sense of relief and concern. Lifting the restrictions can go both ways. It really depends on how sensibly people behave now. Life must go on. I'm not worried that people are going to drop dead around me. People just don't keep their distance. You cannot imagine how many walk past just five centimeters away from me. Public backing for the restrictions imposed has so far been always upwards of 90%, and Angela Merkel's approval ratings have also soared. Germany's health system has so far been spared being pushed to the limit. Now the German Chancellor is concerned that Germans may over-celebrate the easing of restrictions, and it will take at least two weeks until she finds out. So let me ask Danny Cohn-Bendit, do you share the Chancellor's concern about a premature relaxation of restrictions? I know that in a recent interview, you praised her leadership, for example, in comparison with the martial rhetoric of President Macron. Yes, uh, internally she is doing well. The problem is when she doesn't talk about Europe and what she, we can discuss this after. I just want to, to come back to the difference between France and Germany. I think the critics on the German uh, system, health system, was exactly the same in the wording before Corona that it was in France. We shot beds, we shot hospitals, they, have two, they didn't have enough nurse, etc., etc. The big difference is the federal system. The federal system is stronger. The, if it's good managed, and it is good managed in Germany, you have a health minister in every lender. It's why, even if they have less money, they are 
they organize it better of lend of this decentralized uh, level and this is a big difference between france and germany and i think a part of the german society will be aware to continue to keep the one and a half two meters there will be and a part of not it's it's a problem but at the end you can't lock down for months and months the people the family don't you can't do it a family with three kids in a 60 meters apartment is impossible you can do it five weeks six weeks and then they, it will explode so the also also the french have to understand that we have to improve in distance uh, 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 in distance etc but we have to open a little bit if not, the people will don't resist to go out without any restriction because it's too hard. May I, may I just ask Matan von Marshall to weigh in on this point? Are you concerned about premature relaxation of the restrictions? Well, I feel that we um, members of parliament, when we are in discussions with the people of our regions, of our constituencies, we are facing high pressure, especially from the business people because they have been, they, they couldn't, they hadn't worked for the last weeks. I mean, we have uh, programs to support them, but uh, let's say those who sell goods in the cities, those who run restaurants, uh, hotels, they are basically in a very difficult situation and they urge us to do most, uh, uh, to do whatever we can do to relax these, uh, these strict um, regulations. Um, I think for the moment being, we are going a smooth way. We do it step by step. We, we ask our people to, to, to cooperate. We, we, we try to avoid you know, strict measures. Of course, if there is big parties, we, we, we must be strict. But we try to take the people with us and uh, try to make them sensitive due to the fact that we will not overcome the crisis in a few weeks, but we will need to wait until we have medicament and vaccination. And this will take probably all ab almost about a year. So we must, as Daniel cohn says, get used to a certain culture of distant behavior. Uh, I think we can manage this. We can manage it in supermarkets, but it's it's a hard way of, which also might be, if I may say so, different in Latin countries, in Mediterranean countries, and in no more northern countries, because we have different forms of, uh, let's say, uh, being close together. Uh, yeah. Of physical uh, distance is different in cultures in countries. Uh, I think we are. <laughs> In between, uh, in southern Germany, we are somewhat more Latin, uh, but le like say, let's in Hamburg. But uh, I think there is a different culture which uh, which we might have in that respect in Europe. All right, let's bring in uh, Siamak Agababai on, on this issue of uh, the mindset of different what? nations. Uh, you can see. Uh, you can see Germany from your window, you can almost say, since uh, after all, in Strasbourg, you have a tramway line that runs to Kelle yes. on the German side. Uh, you heard Daniel Conventit there, you heard Martin van Marshall. Is there a French mindset that makes it harder to observe the rules? Well, I, I don't think so. Maybe I, I just can say before, before answering your question that uh, maybe uh, the first difference between France and Germany was uh, uh, the, um, uh, the attitude facing this crisis. In Germany, they adopted um, a massive testing strategy and uh, a more loose uh, lockdown. Uh, in France, we have uh, very, uh, not, not a massive testing strategies because tests were uh, reserved for healthcare people and, uh, and, and very, uh, very uh, severe cases. Uh, and now we have a general lockdown uh, that may uh, uh, last something about uh, two months, uh, maybe more. Uh, some 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 people said I'm I agree with Daniel Conveni that you can keep people this way uh, and there is no evidence today apart from uh, statistical models that the general lockdown is better 
uh, than a specific lockdown. So I think that we should, in all the countries, be able to, uh, uh, to have a massive testing strategy, so PCR or serologic tests, uh, and then, uh, and then uh, proceed by uh, specified lockdown, maybe, and treat, treat people you can treat. And at the end, I can say that I don't think there is a difference uh, between between France and Germany, I think what is different it's uh, is the political discourse of the president Macron and what the German president say. I think we need to move from fear to trust. We should trust people. We should trust in in their uh, in their understanding, and they can understand and they can uh, do better uh, than what we think they can do. Yeah, when Frank Walter Steinmeier spoke uh, ten days back. Uh, he uh, seemed to be almost taking a dig at Emmanuel Macron for employing martial language uh, in his initial speeches. Um, we're going to talk more about that in a moment. First off, northwest of where Siamak is, there is the Lorraine border town of Carling. And there, they've been keeping one essential service open. It's a report from France24.com's uh, web desk by Sam Ball. <laughs> Ils n'osent plus venir, il y en a beaucoup moins qui viennent parce que ils ont des contrôles. Ils ne peuvent plus passer par chez nous. Et avant, il y avait beaucoup, beaucoup d'Allemands qui venaient acheter le pain. Et puis maintenant, vu les contrôles, alors, alors ce qu'on peut faire maintenant, c'est que je rapporte le pain, je leur ai laissé mon numéro de téléphone et puis ils m'appellent quand ils arrivent et je leur rapporte le pain de l'autre côté de la barrière. Also wir stehen hier an der deutsch-französischen Grenze zwischen Lauterbach und Karlinge. Und wir kaufen hier schon seit über zig Jahrzehnte in unserer lieben Bäckerei Brote und Croissants für unser tägliches Leben. Und jetzt dürfen wir zu Fuß nicht mehr rüber. Und als Zeichen der deutsch-französischen Freundschaft machen wir einen Online-Handel. So. <lacht> Glücklich auf der deutschen Seite gelandet. Oh. Miriam, herzlichen Dank für diese deutsch-französische Geste. So. So a great example there of how innovative people can become in a crisis, necessity being the mother of invention. But as you mentioned, Matan von Marshall, in fact, the border closures have caused a good deal of disruption, serious disruption. What would you say, looking at cross-border cooperation as a whole, how healthy is Franco-German solidarity in general? Uh, basically, I think we, France and Germany, always have different views on things. But as we discuss together, we can find a compromise. And if we reach a compromise, this often can be a model for the other member states of the European Union to follow. That is basically how I would like to subscribe uh, our partnership. Um, a very specific partnership, of course, is the one we are having between Alsace and um, southwestern Germany, specifically Baden, because we are almost the same culture um, historically. And uh, therefore, I really am very sad about the fact that we have had the borders 
closed. And this can't go on. As I said in the beginning, we must open again these borders, of course, under maintaining strict standards of hygienic measurement measures, that is quite clear. But we must meet again, because that is the reason why in Europe we build friendships. We have the Schengen area, all people can move, can get together. We have the students in the Erasmus program. Europe has built a community of common values, of, um, uh, of, of democracies, and uh, that is the reason uh, why we, we, we can maintain that only if we come together, if we talk together. And if you have borders, you talk in a different way about your neighbor. You even might have prejudices and you talk about people which sooner or later you will not know anymore. And that is what we have to avoid. And therefore, in our cross-border cooperation, uh, I will fight for opening the borders again quite soon. Dr. Siamakaga Babai, after spending the last few days at emergency dispatch uh, in Strasbourg, are you in favor of reopening the border? Uh, well, I think we uh, uh, we have so, soon or later we have to reopen the border. And uh, but we, what we should do first is a massive testing strategy and finding the best way to do it. Is it serological tests? Uh, uh, are we? Uh, do we trust all the serological tests? And uh, some studies are being conducted in the. Strasbourg University Hospital. You heard Martin von Marshall say that's going to take time. Are you saying in the interim, keep the border shut? Well, I think the border can reopen after the 11th of May, after the end of the general lockdown in, in, in France. I think it will be, a, it will be a, a, the day for the reopening, but not sooner, I think. All right. In his recent interview with the Financial Times, Emmanuel Macron repeated what he said in a national broadcast here in France a week ago. That is that uh, coming out of this crisis, humanity would be rethinking its priorities. And that includes, he says, the European Union. Nous sommes à un moment de vérité qui consiste à savoir si l'Union européenne est un projet politique ou un projet de marché uniquement. Moi, je pense que c'est un projet politique. Quand c'est un projet politique, D'abord, l'humain est au premier chef. Il y a des notions de solidarité qui se jouent. Si on n'y va pas, il y a un vrai risque de l'effondrement de la zone euro. Oui, ben oui, il faut être clair. Et de l'Europe et de l'idée européenne. Je ne sais pas par quoi ça commencera, mais c'est évident. C'est évident. So let me ask, uh, first of all, Martin von Marshall and then Daniel Cohn-Bendit, whether you agree with the French president and what that means quite concretely. Europe's moment of truth, more solidarity. Is Germany going to have to put a lot more money on the table to ensure EU recovery? Well, I think um, we are about to do that. Uh, the, the Euro finance ministers have agreed on three points. First, uh, to strengthen the European stability mechanism so that countries that might have difficulties to get access to money, which could be true for, especially for Italy, would have easily access through the ESM. That is the first thing. Then the second, that is for companies, is a credit program from the European Investment Bank, which I think is very important for small, for medium size, for big companies. And then the third thing is the so-called SURE program, that is to support people that for the moment being have no work, but that could return to their original job. And in this meantime, need some support. In all these three programs, Germany is prepared to give guarantees. These guarantees sum up to quite a big amount uh, of billions of euros. And I think that is a first step. The second step will be, of course, a recovery program, which we might include in the next multi-annual financial framework of the European Union. And of course, Germany, as biggest contributor in the European Union of net amount, uh, because now the United Kingdom has left us, we are alone the biggest uh, net payer there. 
uh, will, of course, contribute in solidarity with those that are weaker. And I think these are important um, steps we are taking. But of course, we need to continue because it is also in our and the German interest that the complete Eurozone and that the European Union maintains stable. That's where a lot of German exports go. Uh, Daniel Cohn-Bendit, noticeable by omission in that list uh, that Matthijs von Marshall just gave us, are of course joint European bonds to fund recovery. Isn't it time for Germany to give up its long-standing resistance to mutualization of debt, at least debt that will be incurred in future for recovery from this pandemic? Well, when we heard uh, Mr. Marshall, we, we see the problem. He said we are, Germany is the biggest net payer. Germany is the biggest net winner of the European Union, not only the biggest net payer. And I think that all the debate now is you have to make, understand psychologically what it means for Italy and what it means for Spain or Portugal or Greece or even uh, other countries. The problem is that the Italian will, they want to, to hear that for the recovery fund, Germany, Holland, uh, uh, Swe uh, Sweden, they are prepared to risk something for the recovery. And this is what I miss by uh, um, uh, Chancellor Merkel's speech that is a yes, of course, we will do solidarity, but we won't risk something. In a situation like this, to put in common a fund for recovery is that Germany will take with France, with Italy, with Spain, with the others, the risk of the big, the, the, Mr. Dabrowski, the commissioner, talks about one and a half billion for the recovery. You can't do this only if all the country are, we are ready to, to guarantee this fund for the recovery. And to say we guarantee, we say we share the risk. This is what the people in Italy, in Spain, and other where they want to hear, the share of the risk of the recovery. Sharing the risk, uh, Matan van Marshall, uh, we could change the name if you like. Uh, will there be at the end some deal? I noticed, by the way, uh, Emmanuel Macron in his interview, that interview with the Financial Times, seemed to be hinting that, yeah, there's something in the works between France and Germany. Is Germany ready to take that risk that Daniel Convendi talks about? I must uh, make very clear that we are taking big risk because these three programs, which I mentioned before, in the ESM, the European Investment Bank, and the SURE program for worker, uh, mean that we guarantee more than 10 billion euros, which we are prepared to lose in the worst case. And all these three programs are not meant to support Germany but are meant to support those who have big difficulties now. But what I was mentioning when I was talking about the future recovery plans, I think that we will be able to find a way that the European Commission, that is also true for the SURE program for the workers, can, uh, can emit uh, money. Uh, of course, the member states because the European Union has not a proper budget, but only the member states have proper national budgets. The member states must always guarantee there. And then the amount of guarantees and therefore also the amount, the volume of risk for Germany in the future will be a lot bigger. But let me point out one thing to the euro bonds. I am absolutely convinced that even if we would have a majority in the German parliament, um, the uh, constitutional court in Germany would not uh, accept such a legislation because uh, it exceeds, um, it goes over the responsibilities. We as parliamentarians for the national budget 
cannot do what in Europe is known as bailout. We cannot give the budget to, uh, to, to, to Europe. It is our own national responsibility. And um, I'm quite uh, I'm curious to see how our debates of these three programs, which I mentioned before, will be going on in the Bundestag. But I'm very sure that the Constitutional Court will not accept, would not accept such a decision. Let me bring in Daniel Kambendit. We're we'll running short on time. Daniel Kambendit, uh, uh, the buck stops at Germany's Constitutional Court? No, because it's, it's, it's completely wrong. You have, you have two things. First, we have to increase the European budget by own incomes. No. You have the CO2 incomes. The CO2 own incomes means not that Germany pay more, that France pay more, that Italy pay more, but that they are own incomes of Europe. And this can be the CO2 tax, it can be the plastic tax, the digital tax, and this would be an enormous increase of the European budget. And with this set type of increase, you can guarantee more for the recovery cup. And there, the, the, the German courts has nothing to say because you have own resources. Export, import in Europe is their own resource. It doesn't go to the one of the other countries. So this is the first thing. The second thing is, a recovery fund, a recovery fund in this situation will be guaranteed by the European Central Bank. And if the European Central Bank guarantee the European Court always backed the politics of the European Central Bank, even if the German Central Bank said it's not constitutional. So I'm not so afraid of the German. This is a trick. I'm sorry, okay. Mr. Marshall. Let, it is a trick no, of the let me CDU cut, not I'm to sorry. discuss the thing. With an I eye on the have... time, let me cut that part of the discussion right there, because I'd like to bring in Dr. Siemek uh, Babai now toward the end of the program to ask for your view, uh, Dr. Babai, on how the EU can play a constructive role in recovery. You are sitting there in Strasbourg in the city where the EU parliament normally meets. In fact, it did not hold its last session in March. It is currently closed. And now the EU has offered to the city of Strasbourg to do COVID-19 testing at the facilities of the parliament. Beyond that gesture, what do you think is needed from the EU? Well, first I have to thank our German colleagues who uh, have accepted transfers of patients in uh, the ICU beds and permitting us uh, doing uh, continuing uh, doing uh, our job and, and uh, saving people uh, for the IC, remaining ICU beds. So that was really a really great uh, act. And I want to thank German, uh, German people, German authorities, and German colleagues. What we need now, uh, and when I heard uh, the discussion uh, between, uh, between our two invites, is that what can European Union do for, uh, uh, for European people? What we need to hear is that what Europe uh, does mean to me? What can it change? Uh, how Europe can change our healthcare system? How Europe can change... Uh, the situation of the people who have lost their job, entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, uh, how, how Europe can help pe people who are homeless. So how we can move from uh, what was the vision of uh, uh, economic Europe, how can we move forward to a more integrated, maybe more federal and maybe more political Europe, which, uh, uh, in, in which uh, the social parts and the ecological questions will be, uh, uh, I think, uh, what we most need in the next uh, in the next years. The great citizens of Strasbourg are, are in our thoughts. Uh, Siamak Aga Babai, uh, there at the uh, heart of it all, those first responders that you yourself work with every day. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, from the Alsatian capital. I want to thank as well uh, Matern von Marshall for being uh, with us uh, from Berlin, Daniel Convendit in Frankfurt. I'm Francois Picard for France 24 in Paris.
And I am Melinda Crane for Deutsche Welle in Berlin. And let me say thank you as well to all of our viewers for joining us on this premiere, this joint edition of the debate. We're glad you could be with us and we hope to see you again soon. Bye bye. <laughs>